When The Division released in 2016, it broke all the records in the video game industry. It was the best-selling Ubisoft game ever, grossing over $330 million in the first week alone, with over 1.2 million concurrent players during the weekend of the launch. And yet, The Division today is also known for losing almost all of those players in a record amount of time, that it never, not even with The Division 2, managed to get back. In today's day and age, it seems that Ubisoft has all but completely forgotten about this franchise, with only the second game being kept on life support, not even having a big enough dev team to properly deploy bug fixes, and with no words of any sequel on the way. There is of course the PvP-focused spin-off, which has been in development since The Division 2, that is somehow still stuck in development four years later, and then there's the mobile knockoff, which I'm not really going to count as a real game. And to be honest, I don't think either of these titles will be very successful, because at this point, the Division brand has been too damaged and has been left in the cold for too long for a bunch of random spin-off titles to suddenly come in and gain a substantial audience. I'm willing to go as far to say that even with a Division 3, we wouldn't see that much success for the franchise. And at this point, a hard reboot might be the only way forward if Ubisoft ever wanted to give it a proper try again. And for the record, I still believe that they should, because there is still a huge market for this type of video game that at the moment is not being fulfilled. You have to look no further than a game called The Day Before, a very sketchy indie title that everybody knows probably has more than a few things wrong with it. And yet, the initial gameplay reveal now sits at 5 million views on YouTube, with a mostly positive reception and it remains to be the most wishlisted game on Steam, before it was removed by Steam, that is. If a disaster like that can get that much positive attention, then I think that that's a pretty clear sign that there's still a gap in the market. So where is the division then, and why isn't it filling that gap right now? Where did things go so wrong that this record-breaking franchise ends up not being relevant at all in today's discussion anymore? To get a good answer for all of this, I think we have to go back quite a bit. Not as far as you might think, but we do have to look at the Division 1 before it released. Because part of the initial success that The Division 1 had, had a lot to do with what the game promised to be, or what players thought the game would be, instead of what it ended up becoming. And no, this is not going to be another video about the small differences in graphical fidelity, which although it was a controversial topic at the time, mostly because of the Watch Dogs fiasco, The Division could have honestly looked half as good and still been among the industry's best looking titles. Graphics was never really an issue for this game. The real issue that The Division has had since day one is a confusing identity. Open world, always online, role-playing game, looter, shooter, looter shooter, cover-based shooter, action-adventure game, a live service game. All of these terms are used by either massive studios, Ubisoft or the press to describe what the game was at different stages of development. And while it's pretty obvious what The Division is nowadays, before launch, Everybody sort of had their own ideas and hopes of what the franchise would turn out to be. It was always pretty obvious that, yes, enemies would have health bars, and that loot would be a big focus of the experience, but around that, it could really be anything. To really put some things in perspective, when in 2015 I was flown out to E3 to try out the playable demo for The Division, one of the developers came up to me and asked how I liked the game now that I finally got to play it. The answer that I gave him is that it was different, and it was not at all what I was expecting. It wasn't bad, per se, but it was also not that good, it was just different. And I certainly wasn't the only one thinking that. Not at all what I expected. I don't know about you, but it's definitely more of an RPG than a shooter, mm -hmm. which maybe that's what everybody's expected, that's not what I expected, yeah. and so it threw me for a little bit of a loop. Now I can name a whole list of popular influencers at the time that I talked to that found the gameplay a complete 180 of what they had expected from the trailers. But I'm not telling you this to use other people's opinions to further back up my own, I'm telling you this so that you can get a really good idea of how little we actually knew about the game. Because if I, a guy who spent the better parts of two years researching this game for his YouTube channel, was so blindsided by what the game actually played like, then you might also imagine how it would be for the average player. And nothing reflects this more than the number one complaint that players had about The Division 1 when it finally launched, which were the bullet spongy enemies. 
Nowadays, when you bring up this topic around the division, the more hardcore player base will usually react either one of two ways. They will either tell you that your weapons and your gear is probably not that great, and that once you get really good gear, enemies will die very quickly. Or those players will tell you that, yeah, the game is an RPG. Bullet spongy enemies is kind of like part of the genre. The thing is, is that both of those answers are accurate. If you get good gear, enemies die faster, and bullet spongy enemies are part of the genre. But that kind of sidesteps the complaints that players had. Because while it is part of the genre, and while good gear can fix that problem, many players simply didn't think that the vision was going to be that type of game. They didn't think it would lean that heavily into its RPG mechanics. So when they're saying that they didn't like the bullet spongy enemies, what they're actually saying is, is that they didn't enjoy the genre of video game. What they expected was something with a little bit more emphasis on the shooting, something among the lines of a tactical shooter with RPG light mechanics attached to it. I looked at it, I'm like, okay, tactical shooter, found out that it's not just the tactical shooters. And you can't really blame the players for this either, because there's plenty of footage of stealth takedowns that was shown pre-release, footage of players using their skills to distract enemies instead of simply adding more damage. All those trailers with those fake voice communications have the supposed players constantly talking about staying out of sight and trying not to be spotted. Okay, let's take these guys out first as quietly as possible. The dynamic weather and day and night cycle was always mentioned in interviews and was forefront of the advertising material. Gameplay footage shows players scavenging for food or water. The name Tom Clancy is on the box of all things. So while it is a fair point to make that a lot of this footage was simply outdated by the time that the game came out and didn't really represent what the game would ultimately be, you can't really blame players for thinking that it would turn out more like a tactical shooter. And so the product being so much different than the expectations that the players had of it, that was the main reason that a big part of those initial players quit playing very fast. Very rapidly, it became clear that the Division was an RPG and an RPG only, which automatically removed any possible gameplay features that didn't fit inside that box. Instead of using the thick mist, the snow or the fog to break line of sight or to ambush enemies, you see everybody's health bar from a mile away, regardless of the weather. You also have a radar that shows you enemies close by, so you're never really surprised to find some enemies. And because it is an RPG, enemy difficulty comes mostly from how much health and how much damage they have. And stealth mechanics don't go deeper than being detected or not being detected. You can throw a seeker mine to the other end of the street, and if it aggros just one enemy, all of the other NPCs in the vicinity instantly know of your location. You don't use weapon attachments like a scope or a silencer to be more accurate or to see further at longer ranges or to fight without making noise, no, you use them for more critical hit chance or more headshot damage. Fights can't even occur further than 100 meters away. Enemies don't even render beyond 100 meters range. Instead of gathering supplies like water or food or maybe medicine or clothing to keep yourself warm, you're gathering 30 boxes of electronics to craft and slot in a bunch of stat boosting gear mods. And every piece of loot is always highlighted clearly, meaning that it just becomes a matter of clearing the map instead of carefully searching. The Division left any subtlety out of the door. It is an RPG and an RPG only. It just so happens to also have guns and also have a setting that would be very much suited for a more tactical game. You want to really know why The Division lost about 90% of its initial player base? It had something to do with the lack of content for sure, and the game being very buggy was also part of the reason. But the single biggest cause for this is that The Division simply was not the game that a lot of players had hoped it to be. That's all. And, well, for the remaining players, the players that appreciated The Division for what it was, well, those players, they would be in for quite a wild ride. Because while The Division was such an RPG-heavy title, the structure and all the in-game systems didn't support such a game. And it did not have the content required for a game of that type to flourish. In fact, the structure of the game was laid out more similarly to a single-player game, with a set of main missions to follow and a bunch of copy-and-paste side activities. The only difference here being that it slapped a level requirement to each mission, giving you the illusion of choice of what to do first, 
But at the end of the day, if you're being honest, most players would still play through them in the same order because of the level gating. And besides the story, there was also no proper endgame grind. In fact, the only real endgame was the Dark Zone, which worked for some players, but not nearly for everybody, and actually went against the whole philosophy of what a loot-based shooter is supposed to be. Let me explain. I think it is a fair argument to make that a lot of players that typically enjoy these type of RPG games that rely super heavily on gear, they enjoy that in a PvE setting. Because in such settings, you're playing versus the AI, and the experience is fairly consistent. So in that type of setting, when you improve your build, you can see real changes and improvements in the gameplay. You can see yourself become more powerful. And that is what makes such a game tick for that audience. In PvP, however, and especially in the Dark Zone, there are a lot more variables that are often far more important than one's build. Of course, the individual skill of the player is among them, but simply having three friends to play with is oftentimes just as important. Going up against four players, or someone with simply much more playtime and therefore likely a lot more skill, is something that even the best gear or the best builds cannot offset. And when factors other than the gear become much more important than any sort of build that you can put together, in the only type of endgame activity that the game offers at launch, then the game instantly loses the appeal of the part of the player base that was there mostly for the build crafting. So in that way, the division cut out a big part of the player base twice in a row. It cut out everybody else that did not want an RPG game, and then it cut out the audience that was interested in that type of RPG game, leaving only a very select few amount of players that really enjoyed the weird niche that the Dark Zone offered at the time. This issue was then also compounded by the fact that some of the best gear could only be obtained from within the Dark Zone through special level 31 blueprints that you could only buy after reaching a specific Dark Zone rank. So even if players just wanted to play the same story missions and perfect their build for some reason, well, they couldn't. Not without participating in PvP in the Dark Zone at least. Most of the players were forced to participate in an activity that at its core clashed with the fantasy that the game tried to offer. And this then created a snowball effect that lasted for many months in where the rich just got richer and the rest of the player base got cut off. The more skilled players and those that were there from launch and those that played in groups were able to get the better gear from the Dark Zone. And they did that by denying the rest of the player base in doing the same thing. Where a system like this might have been acceptable in games like Rust, where every couple weeks or months, specific servers wipe and all players get to start all over again for another chance to end up on top. But in the Division, it was not really acceptable because everybody only had one shot and that was at launch. And if you missed out, the endgame became a lot more difficult from there on out. Even when the first incursion dropped a whole month after launch, which was named Falcon Lost and was supposed to be sort of a raid activity, the effects of this could still be felt. Because of course, this activity was balanced around the players having top of the line gear. So the whole part of the player base that was essentially gatekept from getting said gear, now also had a much harder time playing the new content. And of course, Falcon Lost dropped even better loot that could then be taken back into the Dark Zone to start the vicious cycle once again. I won't bore you with all of the details, but the short story of it is that this cycle continued for about three months, at which point the game had more or less just died out. The Dark Zone was a failed experiment. Not one that couldn't be enjoyed, but one that on a base level only clashed with the core fantasy of the game. But it didn't have to be this way. In fact, the Dark Zone could have worked really well. It could have been the best new thing in gaming. It is just that it would have always been a lot harder to achieve that in a game that focuses so heavy around loot and the RPG mechanics. The promise of the Dark Zone at its core is a high stakes environment. But if gear is such a huge factor in the outcome of a fight, it is only high stakes for the players that don't have that gear. And it creates a crushingly unfair experience for the majority of the player base. But if you flip it around, and if gear isn't a huge factor in a game that super heavily focuses on collecting gear, then obviously that betrays the core fantasy that the game promises to deliver. 
because why would you min-max and invest hundreds of hours into collecting gear if it's not going to change the outcome of any fight? If hopping on an aim trainer for 30 minutes a day makes a bigger difference in whether you have success or not. All of this isn't to say that it's impossible to create an environment where both gear and player skill combine to make a balanced experience. But again, that would be a lot easier to achieve if the game focused a bit more on the tactical shooting aspect of it. Now over the lifespan of the division, the developers put a lot of effort into trying to address these issues, but never to great success and oftentimes at the cost of other things. And that actually leads me into my last point for the division, which is the post-launch support that the game received. And look, I'll be the last person to say that the developers didn't try their best to patch up the game where possible, even going as far as inviting active players over to their studio to work on solutions together. You might have heard the stories of the many big overhauls the game apparently went through and how this time, this time things would be different. And although yeah, the core of the game improved substantially over its lifetime, it all doesn't change the fact that The Division 1 remains to be a case study of how not to do post-launch content for a live service game. Much like the story and the main campaign part of The Division, the year one DLC releases were very similar to what you would expect out of a single player game. They're all separate packages that have their own little isolated experiences that add nothing to the core gameplay loop. That isn't to say the DLC was bad, it was alright. Especially the survival DLC, the second DLC release was praised by many players precisely because it offered a Dark Zone type high stakes environment better than the base game did. But as with every DLC that has nothing connecting it to the base game, it has an expiration date. And once people get tired of it, the base game feels just as empty as it did before. The only originally planned out year one DLC that somewhat enriched the open world of the base game were the incursions and the Dark Zone expansion. The Dark Zone expansion was nice and offered a good looking, denser and more vertical play space. But more Dark Zone was not what the game needed. Quite the opposite actually, it needed more stuff everywhere else in the game. Not to mention that despite the good looks, the Dark Zone now also became so big that rogue groups could run from the south to the north and back to get rid of a full 5 minute timer. Which made trying to get revenge oftentimes a lot more difficult. And incursions didn't really become good up until the very last one. You know, Falcon Lost is just 15 waves of hiding in a tunnel under the map in order to not get completely destroyed by the overtuned NPCs. It's a bit easier now, but back when it came out it was that bad. And Clear Sky and Dragon's Nest not only had their own set of issues, but also had loot that simply wasn't worth chasing because the developers were too afraid to release anything more powerful than Sentry or Striker after seeing the effects that those gear sets had on the game. The open world eventually did receive some sort of overhaul with patch 1.4, which was sort of this emergency patch that I mentioned earlier, where the developers invited active players over to their studio, and that did a lot of work into fixing some of the core issues. It made more activities in the open world rewarding to play, and although this was very healthy for the game, it also kickstarted the constant back and forth struggle that Massive and supporting studios now had to deal with, because even though patch 1.4 fixed a lot, there was even more work to be done. And with their enthusiasm of fixing the game, that meant that every patch also came with a lot of big changes to almost every aspect of the game, which was all very good from a balanced perspective, but in a loot-based shooter, it's not always the best thing. Because it also means that with every patch, even if it's just a minor one, you'd basically be starting from zero again. The drop that really made the bucket spill was when on the year 2 celebration stream that the developers had, which a lot of players looked up to as the big reveal for what the plans were for year 2, the game director at the time dropped a bombshell that any further substantial content was simply not going to be a possibility. One, one thing's for sure though is that a large paid DLC expansion of uh, the, uh, the playable area into uh, uh, yeah. Queens. Like a uh, level cap increase. Mm. and A or, level cap yeah, increase, yeah. that's off the table. Okay, um, just, I just want to make it clear to people. Yeah, that they, I think it's clarity kind of is, is our friend and that is really off the table. This felt as if Ubisoft had completely given up on a division. And if that was the case, then why make all those drastic changes just months before? What was the point? Surely, this was not the fault of the developers, but the backlash to this was understandably quite large. 
and it permanently blemished the reputation that the franchise had. It went from a sloppy game currently that could over time be built up into something much greater to yet another Ubisoft IP that would get a new release every couple of years. Or in the worst case, Ubisoft would just cut the funding entirely and let it die. It ended up being the former in this case. Whatever way you put it though, the magic around the game and the thoughts of what it still could become, all of that was gone, even among the most hardcore fans. And although Ubisoft eventually caved in and announced that they listened to the feedback and would still release one more proper DLC, including a map expansion, it was obvious that their hearts and wallets weren't in it anymore. And that they were mostly doing it to keep the fan base somewhat satisfied until the sequel was ready. Anyway, that last year of The Division 1 was pretty bad on a good day and pretty much unplayable on a bad day. Even the few that remained were met with an extreme influx of hackers and bugs that never really got fixed as Massive at this point had completely abandoned the Division 1 in favor of working on the Division 2. Look out! We have a manhunt active in your vicinity. Ubisoft is shit. Reporting Ubisoft, not me. This game not protect. Sorry, man. I'm not bad g man. I'm good man. Ubisoft is fuck Ubisoft. This is not me problem. Ubisoft is problem. This is no protect game. Uh, the division two is uh, no protect. I don't know. I'm sorry, man. Don't cry. It's good man. Happy, happy nice day. Things got so bad at one point that I had to push out multiple videos on a singular game breaking bug, which caused players to run in place and effectively shoot through walls in PvP. I had to post multiple videos of that just of a chance to get it fixed, which I eventually did, but I then got shamed by the developers in private messages for diverting company resources that could have gone to the Division 2. That is how much they still cared about the Division 1, if there were any questions about that left. So by the time that the Division 2 was getting close to release, everybody was ready to make the switch. And uh, well, on the surface, the Division 2 looked very promising because it set out to address and fix most of the biggest issues that the first game had. Enemies feeling too tanky? Okay, instead of giving them a large health bar, why not give them a bunch of armor that can be destroyed individually to wear them down in a more natural way and create some weak points. That's a good start. How about gear and rewards? Let's make loot exciting again from the start this time. Let's also include a proper endgame loop that dynamically changes the map and creates different control points you can fight for. Let's just give players more stuff to do. And what about the dark zone? Well, make it dark zones, as in multiple, because we have three of them now. The max player count will be 12 instead of 24, but that's good, right? Because at the end of the Division 1, in that dark zone, well, 24 players were obviously too much because no one could go rogue anymore. Got a fan. Video is moving. Movie is very good to be soft by, by a con. Cheater. 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 Are these people, dude? <laughs> oh. <laughs> this guy, he flagged. He's ballsy. They got balls, yeah. I mean, they're not surviving that long. Let's also have a dedicated PvP mode at launch. Oh. And remember those incursions? Yeah, no, the Division 2 will not have those stupid incursions. We will have raids, actual raids. Short story, in every way, the Division 2 was going to be an improvement, according to the advertisement at least. Because quickly after launch, the Division 2 was considered to be a commercial failure by Ubisoft and a step backwards by a big part of the player base. And yes, it's actually considered a commercial failure by Ubisoft, who apparently thought that 10 million copies sold within the first year was not successful enough. So what could have possibly caused this? Why wasn't The Division 2 the success that it should have been? For starters, we have to go back to The Division 1 again and the first point that I made talking about that game. Because what The Division 2 promised to be is Division 1, but better. But remember that a lot of players that bought into The Division 1 at launch did so not knowing exactly what the game would be. 
and they had a lot of different expectations from it. With The Division 2, everybody kind of knew what it was, and especially after the beta came out, that only reinforced that idea of, yeah, it's just Division 1, but it's a bit better now. And the target audience for The Division the way it is simply isn't as big as the target audience for The Division of what it could be. With RPG mechanics being just as much of the focus, if not more, that instantly cut off everybody who wasn't already invested in that type of experience, who was hoping that Division 2 would move more into the tactical shooter genre that doesn't so heavily rely on stats and gear alone. That is in fact the Division 2's first mistake. It was not recognizing what most players had hoped the Division to be, and instead laser focusing on just making the same game again, but try to do it better. And it wasn't even better necessarily, because either a lot of the so-called fixes that had been put in place to prevent the same issues from repeating did not really fix the problems at their core, or they went so far overboard with the fixes that it hurt the gameplay in other areas. Let's talk about the cover system, for example. It is pretty common knowledge that the cover system in the Division 1 wasn't really used too much. Of course, PvP fights always turned out like a mess of players running around each other in the hopes to dodge bullets instead of being more stationary. But even in harder PvE content, using cover was often more of a death sentence. Think about Falcon Lost, where mortars would constantly force you out of cover and instantly kill you if you didn't, and where fighting those extremely powerful NPCs was only really possible by abusing head glitch angles from the middle of a pit. Or think about the legendary missions where enemies hit just as hard. The best way to avoid taking damage isn't by using the cover system. No, it is instead by just hugging the wall without using the cover system, because that exposes much less of your body. Something that was unfortunately also abused quite a bit in PvP, as in some extreme cases, you could completely cover your character model and still shoot around the corner. Or think of Clear Sky where the best way to run that mission is by using ultimate abilities and just tanking through the damage while carrying the fuse boxes. Or think about Stolen Signal, where using the Ballistic Shield is not only more useful than cover, but also mandatory in some cases. Cover, while yeah, it had some uses, it was still always more of a gimmick than a helpful feature. So how did the developers address this with the second Division game? Well, they simply said, Fuck you, you will use cover, or we will make sure that you die, without actually improving the cover mechanics. Medkits are no longer instant abilities, but take a long time to activate now and force you to be stationary. Better do it in cover. Skills take much longer to deploy, apart from a few outliers. Better only do it from cover. Out in the open and getting hit by a sniper or a shotgun? Get staggered. Better stay in cover. I think you're starting to get the point here. Yes, all of this effectively turned the Division 2 more into a cover-based shooter. But did it also result in a game that is more fun to play? I'd argue that it didn't. Because, for example, if cover is forced so heavily on the player anyway, and if players are going to sit in the back anyway because they can't push up that hard anyway, then that heavily limits the build diversity as well as the best builds in the game will only be those with a lot of weapon damage at medium to long ranges. Look at almost every endgame PvE built in the Division 2, and you'll see it's mostly just stacking weapon damage where possible. And guess what? Despite all of that, cover still isn't used that much. And all the same issues still exist, with not using cover often being better when it comes to exposing less of your character, which is especially problematic once again in PvP. The usefulness of the cover system wasn't improved, the game had just been watered down in every other area. Oh, come on, have balls, have balls, this guy does have uh, his snowball. Hey, what the f- look at that shit! Look! Vital signs critical. It's the baby rage though, I like it, I like it. Oh, one shot? Oh, there's a guy. He's low. He's the last one. Like, like, nearly, <laughs> nearly dropped their full armor. What? He, yeah, he's, he's head glitching as well. Like, look yeah, at I that. You can only him. see his arm. Like, for, look at that. He's just I shooting. Can't see. I can't see yeah, you can. <laughs> I, can't see I told you this was still in the game as well. It's like, how could they not fix that shit? They knew it's an issue in Division 1. They built a division from the ground up. It's still an issue in Division 2. Explain. 
right? Explain. Fights in the dark zone are no longer a messy dance between players, sure, but now we have a problem that they always play out in the exact same way, because any opportunities for diversion have essentially been taken away. Two players always start a fight using both of their skills, and then the two players end up shooting each other, face tanking each other, until one or the other drops to the floor. Any other strategies are most of the time just not useful, as every other action takes way too much time and self stuns your character for multiple seconds. So by trying to fix one issue so much, you've essentially created another, and the game is worse off because of it. Instead of handicapping players heavily for not sitting still in cover, the developers could have instead taken the initiative to blend cover and non-cover gameplay better together. Ghost Recon Wildlands is an example of a game that released after The Division 1 but before The Division 2 and had a cover light system where players would still be able to do things like crouch and prone freely, but then as soon as you got next to a piece of cover, it very lightly, very gently snapped you to it, allowing the players to use cover and stay somewhat mobile at the same time. It isn't perfect or very revolutionary and it felt a bit floaty at times, but with proper tweaking and maybe some in-game menu settings on whether you want your character to snap the cover or not, or how harshly you want them to snap the cover, it could have resulted in a much better feeling game. I mean, if we're being really honest here, I'd even go as far to say that a purely cover-based game is kind of outdated in the year 2019. Cover-based games were originally conceived to make aiming on console games easier by removing the need to move and shoot at the same time. And of course, it also worked wonders to make up those cover-based arenas which would suit the limits of the older consoles very well, as these battle arenas with all these pieces of cover they're never more than 30 or 40 square meters wide, nor can they be too vertical without creating some very awkward angles. But that's gaming from a long time ago, and since that time, technology has improved a lot. Controllers are much better, so are the control schemes for controllers and the aiming mechanics used in games. Technology has progressed far past the need for keeping combat areas small, and game engines usually have impressive physics and collision systems to aid a more free movement system. I'd even go as far to say that the average player now is more than capable of shooting while moving at the same time. A lot more than 15 years ago at least, when cover-based shooters were actually somewhat of a thing. So the real questions that the developers should have asked with The Division 2 is why a cover-based system to begin with, especially considering the fact that it wasn't that useful in the first game, and not how can we force players harder to use cover without actually improving the cover mechanics themselves. Another example would be the measurements taken to make the Dark Zone more appealing to newer players, players who didn't enjoy it in the Division 1. It's a noble cause, and one that was very needed, but the solutions put in place just do more harm than good. Are players getting bullied and spawn camped going into the Dark Zone? Simply place these enormous turrets next to every entrance that shoot rogue players on sight, and stun them on top of it. And also make sure to disable VoIP for rogue players so that they can't say mean things. Was this change needed? I'd argue not per se, because in the first game if someone camped a Dark Zone checkpoint, you could just as easily fast travel to another one, and you could also just disable the VoIP or mute specific players if you didn't like what they had to say. Do the turrets fix the issue of players getting camped? No, they don't, because it just means they're getting camped a little bit further away from the entrance, or at the safe house, which doesn't have those turrets. The developers also normalized gear, turning every stat roll on gear to its minimum value the moment that you enter the dark zone, which was supposed to tighten the possible power gap. It works wonders to create a more even playing field, but it had a detrimental effect on build crafting, as you would often need to make the same build twice just to have certain things work in a normalized environment. A big nuisance that made the game infinitely more complicated, even for the casual player. We can also talk about the endgame content and how despite the map having more activities, there still wasn't really a reason to do most of them, or the fact that yes, enemies have these destructible armor plates now, but they're often still as tanky. I can talk about all of that, but I feel like we're diverging from the main point here, which is that instead of looking at what players liked about the Division 1 and the type of stuff that they would have wanted, 
The developers instead doubled down on the intended vision for the game, even if that intended vision isn't necessarily what players wanted in the first place or what made the game fun. That is where The Division 2 messed up. It was forcing the original vision without actually thinking about the consequences that might have or thinking about why that vision was so important to begin with. I believe it was after the somewhat disappointing release of Warlords of New York, which by all means was a good piece of DLC that should be the benchmark for future DLCs going forward, that Ubisoft decided to gently pull the plug and leave the Division 2 on life support. If Warlords of New York couldn't reignite the flame of the franchise, then nothing could, right? I don't really agree with that line of thinking, but it's an understandable conclusion to get to. And with Massive working on both Avatar and Star Wars, it is unlikely that the development for another mainline Division game is currently ongoing. And even if it is, as I said at the start of the video, releasing a third Division game following the exact same formula but trying to do it better once again, I'm sure it will sell, but it will not be that blockbuster hit that Ubisoft would hope it to be or restore some of the magic that the first game had. What the Division really needs at this point is a complete reboot that fully tries to realize the game that players thought the first game was actually going to be. There's a real opportunity for The Division to create that next big thing. It's still there. There's still that niche that hasn't been filled up yet. Still up for grabs, 10 years later. So I'm just going to end this video by repeating the words of Eves himself and say that, well, Ubisoft, the ball is truly in your court. Thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you guys soon.